Act One, Scene One, London, a street. Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this son of York. And all the clouds that lard upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. Now are our brows bound with victorious wreaths, our bruised arms hung up for monuments, our stern alarms changed to merry meetings, our dreadful marches to delightful measures. Grim visaged war hath smoothed his wrinkled front, and now, instead of mounting barbed steeds to fright the souls of fearful adversaries, he capers nimbly in a lady's chamber to the lascivious pleasing of a lute. But I, that am not shaped for a sport of tricks, am made to court an amorous looking glass. I, that am rudely stamped, and want love's majesty to strut before a wanton ambling nymph. I, that am curtailed of this fair proportion, cheated of feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, Sent before my time into this breathing world scarce half made up, and that's so lamely and unfashionable that dogs bark at me as I halt by them. Why I, in this weak piping time of peace, have no delight to pass away the time, lest I spy my shadow on the sun and descant on mine own deformity. And therefore, since I cannot prove a lover to entertain these fair, well-spoken days, I am determined to prove a villain and hate the idle pleasures of these days. Plots have I laid. Inductions dangerous by drunken prophecies, libels, and dreams. To set my brother Clarence and the king in deadly hate, the one against the other. And if King Edward be as true and just as I am subtle, false, and treacherous, this day should Clarence closely be mewed up about a prophecy which says that G of Edward's heirs the murderer shall be. Dive once down to my soul. Here Clarence comes. Brother, good day. What means this armored guard that waits upon your grace? His majesty, tendering my person's safety, hath appointed this conduct to convey me to the tower. Upon what cause? Because my name is George. <laughs> Lack, <laughs> my lord, that fault is none of yours. He should for that commit your godfathers. Oh, but like his majesty has some intent that you should be new christened in the tower. But what's the matter, Clarence? May I know? Yea, Richard, when I know, for I protest as yet I do not. But as I can learn, he hearkens after prophecies and dreams, and from the cross row plucks the letter G, and says a wizard told him that by G, his issue disinherited should be. And for my name of George begins with G, it follows in his thought that I am he. These as I learn, and such like toys as these, as moved his highness to commit me now. Why, this it is when men are ruled by women. Tis not the king that sends you to the tower, my lady Grey, his wife, Clarence, tis she that tempers him to this extremity. Was it not she and the good man of worship, Anthony Woodville, her brother there, that made him said Lord Hastings to the tower? From whence this present day is he delivered? We are not safe, Clarence. We are not safe. By heaven, I think there's no man as secure but the queen's kindred and night-walking heralds. Heard ye not what an humble suppliant Lord Hastings was to her for his delivery? Humbly complaining to her deity got my Lord Chamberlain his liberty. I'll tell you what. I think it is our way, if we will keep in favor with the king, to be her men and wear her livery. The jealous Orwone widow and herself, since that our brother dubbed them gentlewomen, are mighty gossips in this monarchy. I beseech your graces both to pardon me. His majesty hath straightly given in charge that no man shall have private conference of what degree soever with his brother. Even so, and to please your worship, Brackenberry, you may partake of anything we say. We speak no treason, man. We say the king is wise and virtuous, and his noble queen, well struck in years, fair and not jealous. And that the keen's quinged are made gentle folks. How say you, sir? Can you deny all this? Hmm. I beseech your grace to pardon me, and withal forbear your conference with the noble duke. 
We know thy charge, Brackenbury, and will we obey. We are the queen's abjects and must obey. Brother, farewell. I will enter the king. Whatsoever you employ me and were to call King Edward's widow sister, I will perform it to enfranchise you. Meantime, this deep disgrace and brotherhood touches me deeper than you can imagine. I know it pleaseth neither of us well. Well, your imprisonment shall not be long. Meantime, have patience. I must perforce. Farewell. Go tread the path that thou shalt ne'er return. Simple, plain Clarence. I do love thee so that I will shortly send thy soul to heaven, if heaven will take the present at our hands. Oh, but who comes here? The new delivered Hastings? Good time of day unto my gracious lord. As much unto my good lord Chamberlain. Well, are you welcome to the open air? How hath your lordship brooked imprisonment? With patience, noble lord, as prisoners must. But I shall live, my lord, to give them thanks that were the cause of my imprisonment. No doubt, no doubt. And so shall Clarence, too. For they that were your enemies are his, and have prevailed as much on him as you. Hmm. More pity that the eagles should be mewed, while kites and buzzards prey at liberty. Hmm. What news abroad? Oh, no news so bad abroad as this at home. The king is sickly, weak, and melancholy, and his physicians fear him mightily. Now by St. Paul, this news is bad indeed. Oh, he hath kept an evil diet long, and overmuch consumed his royal person. It is very grievous to be thought upon. What, is he in his bed? He is. Go you before, and I will follow you. He cannot live, I hope. And must not die till George be packed with post horse up to heaven. All in to urge his hatred more to Clarence, with lies well steeled with weighty arguments. And if I fall not in my deep intent, Clarence hath not another day to live. Which done, God take King Edward to his mercy and leave the world for me to bustle in. <laughs> for then I'll marry Warwick's youngest daughter. What? Though I killed her husband and her father? The readiest way to make the wench amends is to become her husband and her father. The which will I. Not all so much for love as for another secret close intent by marrying her which I must reach unto. Oh, but yet I run before my horse to market. Clarence still breathes. Edward still lives and reigns. When they are gone, then must I count my gains. Scene two, the same, another street. Sit down. Set down your honorable load. Honor may be shrouded in a hearse, whilst I a while obsequiously lament the untimely fall of virtuous Lancaster. Quirky cold figure of a holy king, pale ashes of the house of Lancaster, thou bloodless remnant of that royal blood. Be it lawful that I invocate thy ghost to hear the lamentations of poor Anne, wife to thy Edward, to thy slaughtered son, stabbed by the selfsame hand that made these wounds. Lo, in these windows that let forth thy life, I pour the helpless balm of my poor eyes. Oh, cursed be the hand that made these fatal holes. Cursed be the heart that had the heart to do it. Cursed the blood that let this blood from hence. More direful hap betide that hated wretch that makes us wretched by the death of thee than I can wish to adders, spiders, toads, or any creeping venom thing that lives. If ever he have child, abortive be it prodigious and untimely brought to light whose ugly and unnatural aspect may fright the hopeful mother at the view and that be heir to his unhappiness. If ever he have a wife, oh, let her be made more miserable by the death of him than I am made by my young lord and thee. Come, now towards Chertsey with your holy load, 
taken from poles to be interred there, and still, as you are weary of the weight, rest you, whilst I lament King Henry's course. Stay, you that bear the course and set it down. What black magician conjures up this fiend to stop devoted, charitable deeds? Villain, set down the course, or by St. Paul I'll make a course of him that disobeys. My lord, stand back and let the coffin pass. Unmannered dog, stand thou when I command. Advance thy halberd higher than my breast, or by St. Paul I'll strike thee to my foot and spurn upon thee beggar for thy boldness. Thou devil! For God's sake, hence, and trouble us not, for thou hast made the happy earth thy hell, filled it with cursing cries and deep exclaims. If thou delight to view thy heinous deeds, behold this pattern of thy butcheries. <gasps> oh, gentlemen, see, dead Henry's wounds open their congealed mouths and bleed afresh. Flash, flash, thou lump of foul deformity, for tis thy presence which exhales this blood from cold and empty veins where no blood dwells. Thy deed, inhuman and unnatural, provokes this deluge most unnatural. O oh God, which this blood makes, revenge his death. O oh earth, which this blood drinks, revenge his death. Either heaven with lightning strike the murderer dead, or earth gape open wide and eat him quick, as thou dost swallow up this good king's blood, which his hell-governed arm hath butchered. Lady, you know no rules of charity which renders good for bad, blessings for curses. Villain, thou knowst no law of God nor man, no beast so fierce but no some touch of pity. But I know none, and therefore I'm no beast. Oh, wonderful when devils tell the truth. More wonderful when angels are so angry. <sighs> Vouchsafe, divine perfection of a woman, of these supposed evils to give me leave by circumstance to acquit myself. Vouchsafe diffused infection of a man for these known evils but to give me leave by circumstance to curse thy cursed self. Fairer than tongue can name thee, let me have some patient leisure to excuse myself. Fowler than heart can think thee, thou canst make no excuse current but to hang thyself. By such despair I should accuse myself. And by despairing shouldst thou stand excused for doing worthy vengeance on thyself, which didst unworthy slaughter upon others. Say that I slew them not? Why, then they are not dead. But dead they are, and devilish slave by th I did not kill your husband. Why, then he is alive? Nay, he is dead, and slain by Edward's hand. And thy foul throat thou liest. Queen Margaret saw thy murderous falchion smoking in his blood, the which the once didst bend against her breast, but that thy brothers beat aside the point. I was provoked by her slanderous tongue, which laid their guilt upon my guiltless shoulders. Thou wast provoked by thy bloody mind, which never dreamt on aught but butcheries. Didst thou not kill this king? I grant you. Dost grant me, hedgehog? Then God grant me too, thou mayst be damned for that wicked deed. Oh, he was gentle, mild, and virtuous. The fitter for the king of heaven that hath him. He is in heaven, where thou shalt never come. Let him thank me that hope to send him thither, for he was fitter for that place than earth. And thou unfit for any place but hell. Yes, one place else, if you will hear me name it. Some dungeon? Your bedchamber. Ill rest betide the chamber where thou liest. Though will it, madam, till I lie with you? I hope so. I know so. But gentle Lady Anne, to leave this keen encounter of our wits and fall somewhat into a slower method, is not the causer of these timeless deaths of these Plantagenets, Henry and Edward, as blameful as the executioner. Thou art the cause and most accursed effect. Your beauty was the cause of that effect. Your beauty, which did haunt me in my sleep to undertake the death of all the world, 
so I might live one hour in your sweet bosom. Have I thought that? I tell thee, homicide, these nails should rend that beauty from my cheeks. These eyes could never endure sweet beauty's wreck. You should not blemish it if I stood by. As all the world is cheered by the sun, so I by that. It is my day, my life. Black night, or shade thy day, and death thy life. Curse not thyself, fair creature, thou art both. Why would I were to be revenged on thee? It is a quarrel most unnatural to be revenged on him that loveth you. It is a quarrel just and reasonable to be revenged on him that slew my husband. He that bereft thee, lady, of thy husband, did it to help thee to a better husband. His better doth not breathe upon the earth. He lives that loves thee better than he could. Name him. Plantagenet. Why, that was he. The selfsame name, but one of better nature. Where is he? Here. Why dost thou spit at me? Would it were mortal poison for thy sake? Never came poison from so sweet a place. Never hung poison on a fouler toad. Out of my sight, thou dost infect mine eyes. Thine eyes, sweet lady, have infected mine. <sighs> would they were basilisks to strike thee dead! I would they were that I might die at once, for now they kill me with a living death. Those eyes of thine, for mine have drawn salt tears, shamed their aspect with store of childish drops. These eyes that never shed remorseful tear, no, when thy warlike father, like a child, told the sad story of my father's death, and twenty times made pause to sob and weep, that all the standers by had wet their cheeks like trees but dashed with rain. And that sad time my manly eyes did scorn a humble tear. And what these sorrows could not thence exhale, thy beauty hath, and made them blind with weeping. I never sued to friend nor enemy, my tongue could never learn sweet smoothing word. But now thy beauty is proposed my fee, my proud heart sues and prompts my tongue to speak. Teach not thy lips such scorn, for they were made for kissing, lady. Not for such contempt. Thy revengeful heart cannot forgive. Lo, here I lend thee this sharp pointed sword, which if thou please to hide in this true bosom and let the soul forth that adoreth thee, I lay it naked to the deadly stroke and humbly beg the death upon my knee. Nay, do not pause, for I did kill King Henry. But not thy beauty that provoked me. Nay, now dispatch. Twas I that stabbed young Edward. It was thy heavenly face that set me on. Take up the sword again, or take up me. Arise, dissembler, though I wish thy death, I will not be thy executioner. Then bid me kill myself, and I will do it. I have already. Tush, that was in thy rage. Speak it again, and even with the word, that hand which for thy love did kill thy love, shall for thy love kill a far truer love. To both their deaths thou shalt be accessory. I, I would I knew thy heart. Figured in my tongue. I fear me both are false. Then never mind was true. Well, well, put up your sword. Say then my peace is made. That shall you know hereafter. But shall I live in hope? All men, I hope, live so. Vouchsafe to wear this ring. To take is not to give. Look how this ring encompasseth thy finger.
even so thy breast encloseth my poor heart. Wear both of them, for both of them are thine. And if thy poor devoted suppliant may but beg one favor at thy gracious hand, thou dost confirm his happiness forever. What is it? That it would please thee leave these sad designs to him that hath more cause to be a mourner, and presently repair to Crosby Place, where, after I have solemnly interred at Chertsey Monastery this noble king, and wet his grave with my repentant tears, I will with all expedient duty see you, for diverse unknown reasons. I beseech you, grant me this boon. With all my heart, and much it joys me too to see you are become so penitent. Goodly gentlemen, go along with me. Bid me farewell. Tis more than you deserve, but since you teach me how to flatter you, imagine I have said farewell already. Sir, take up the course. Oh, it's Chertsey, noble lord. No, to Whitefriars. There attend my coining. Was ever woman in this humor wooed? Was ever woman in this humor won? I'll have her. But I will not keep her long. What? I, that killed her husband and his father, to take her in her heart's extremest hate, with curses in her mouth, tears in her eyes, the bleeding witness of her hatred by, having God, her conscience, and these bars against me, and I nothing to back my suit at all, but the plain devil and dissembling looks, and yet to win her, all the world to nothing. <laughs> she forgot. Already that brave prince, Edward, her lord, whom I some three months since stabbed in my angry mood at Tewksbury. A sweeter and a lovelier gentleman the spacious world cannot again afford, and will she yet debase her eyes on me that corrupt the golden prime of this sweet prince and made her widow to a woeful bed? On me, whose all not equals Edward's moiety, on me that halt and am unshapen thus, I do mistake my person all this while. Upon my life she finds, although I cannot, myself to be a marvelous proper man. Albeit charges for a looking glass, and entertain some score or two of tailors to study fashions to adorn my body, since I am prepped in favor with myself, will maintain it with some little cost. But first I'll turn yon fellow in his grave, and then return lamenting to my love. Shine out, fair sun, till I have bought a glass that I may see my shadow as I pass. Scene three, the palace. Have patience, madam. There's no doubt his majesty will soon recover his accustomed health. In that you brook it in, it makes him worse. Therefore, for God's sake, entertain good comfort, and cheer his grace with quick and merry words. If he were dead, what would betide of me? No other harm but the loss of such a lord. The loss of such a lord includes all harm. The heavens have blessed you with a goodly son to be your comforter when he is gone. He is young, and his minority is put into the trust of Richard Gloucester, a man who loves me not, nor none of you. Is it concluded that he shall be protector? It, it is determined, not concluded yet, but so it must be if the king miscarry. Here come the lords of Buckingham and Derby. Good time of day unto your royal grace. Good. I make your majesty as joyful as you have been. Saw you the king today, my lord of Derby. But now the duke of Buckingham and I are come from visiting his majesty. What likelihood of his amendment, lords? Madam, good hope. His grace speaks cheerfully. God grant him health. Did you confer with him? Madam, we did. He desires to make atonement betwixt the Duke of Gloucester and your brothers, and betwixt them and my Lord Chamberlain, and sent to warn them to his royal presence. Would all were well, but that will never be. I fear our happiness is at the highest. They do me wrong, and I will not endure it. Who are they that complain unto the king that I forsooth them stern and love them not? 
Because I cannot flatter and speak fair, I must be held a rancorous enemy. Cannot a plain man live and think no harm, but thus his simple truth must be abused by silken sly insinuating jacks. To whom in all this presence speaks your grace? For thee, that hast nor honesty nor grace. When have I injured thee? When done thee wrong? Or thee? Or thee? Or any of your faction? A plague upon you all. His royal person, whom God preserved better than you would wish, cannot be quiet scarce a breathing while, but you must trouble him with lewd complaints. Brother of Gloucester, you mistake the matter. The king, of his own royal disposition, and not provoked by any suitor else, aiming belike at your interior hatred, which in your outward action shows itself against my kindred, brothers, and myself, makes him to send, that thereby he may gather the ground of your ill will, and so remove it. I cannot tell. The world has grown so bad that rems may pray where eagles dare not perch. Since every jack became a gentleman, there's many a gentle person made a jack. Come, come, we know your meaning, Brother Gloucester. You envy my advancement and my friends. God grant we may never have need of you. Meantime, God grants that we have need of you. Your brother is imprisoned by your means, myself disgrace, and the nobility held in contempt. Whilst many fair promotions are daily given to ennoble those that scarce, some two days since, were worth a noble. By him that raised me to this careful height from that contented hap which I enjoyed, I never did incense his majesty against the Duke of Clarence, but have been an earnest advocate to plead for him. My lord, you do me shameful injury falsely to draw me in these vile suspects. You may deny that you were not the cause of my lord Hastings' late imprisonment. She may, my lord, for- She may, Lord Rivers. Why? Who knows not so? She may do more, sir, than denying that. She may help you to many fair preferments, and then deny her aiding hand therein, and lay those honors on your high deserts. What may she not? She may, yea, Mary, may she. What Mary may she? What Mary may she? Mary with a king, a bachelor, a handsome stripling too. I wish your grandam had a worse match. My lord of Gloucester, I have too long borne your blunt upravings and bitter scoffs by heaven. I will acquaint his majesty with those gross taunts I often have endured. I had rather be a country servant maid than a great queen with this condition to be thus taunted, scorned, and baited at. Small joy have I in being England's queen. I mustn't be that small god, I beseech thee. Thy honor, state and seat is due to me. What, let you me with telling of the king? Tell him, and spare not. Look, what I have said, I will avouch in the presence of the king. I dare adventure to be sent to the tower. Tis time to speak, my pains are quite forgot. Oh, devil, I remember them too well. Thou slewest my husband, Henry, in the tower, and Edward, my poor son, at Tewkesbury. Ere you were queen, yea, or your husband king, I was a pack horse in his great affairs, a weeder out of his proud adversaries, a liberal warder of his friends, to royalize his blood, I spilt mine own. Yea, and much better blood than his or thine. In all, which time you and your husband Grey were factious for the house of Lancaster. Let me put in your minds, uh, if you forget, what you have been ere now, and what you are, with all what I have been, and what I am. A murderous villain, and so still thou art. My lord of Gloucester, in those busy days which here you urge to prove us enemies, we followed then our lord, our lawful king. So should we you, if you should be our king. If I should be, <laughs> I'd rather be a peddler. Far be it from my heart, the thought of it. As little joy, my lord, as you suppose you should enjoy, were you this country's king, as little joy may you suppose in me that I enjoy being the queen thereof. I can no longer hold me patient. Hear me, you wrangling pirates that fall out in sharing that which you have pilled from me. <laughs> which of you not trembles that looks on me? If not that I, being queen, you bow like subjects, yet that by you deposed you quake like rebels. <clears throat> Oh, gentle villain, do not turn away. Foul, wrinkled witch, what makes thou in my sight? Wert thou not banished on pain of death? <laughs> I was. But I do find more pain in banishment than death can yield me here by my abode. A husband and a son thou owest to me. And thou a kingdom? All of you allegiance! 
The sorrow that I have by right is yours, and all the pleasures you usurp are mine. The curse my noble father laid on thee, when thou didst crown his warlike brows with paper, and with thy scorn drew river from his eyes. And then, to dry them, gave the duke a cloud steeped in the faultless blood of pretty Rutland. His curses, then from bitterness of soul denounced against thee, are all fallen upon thee. And God, not we, hath plagued thy bloody deed. So just is God to right the innocent. No, oh, twas the foulest deed to slay that babe, and the most merciless that e'er was heard of. Tyrants themselves wept when it was reported. No man but prophesied revenge for it. What? Were you all snarling before I came, ready to catch each other by the throat and turn your hatred now on me? <laughs> Did your dread curse prevail so much with heaven that Henry's death, my lovely Edward's death, their kingdom's loss, my woeful banishment could all but answer for that peevish brat? Can curses pierce the clouds and enter heaven? Why, then give way, dull clouds, to my quick curses. If not by war, by surfeit, die your king, as ours by murder, to make him a king. Edward, thy son, which now is prince of Wales, for Edward, my son, which was prince of Wales, die in his youth by like untimely violence. Thyself a queen for me that was a queen, outlive thy glory like my wretched self. Long mayest thou live to wail thy children's loss, and see another as I see thee now, decked in thy rights as thou art stalled in mine. Long die thy happy days before thy death, and after many lengthened hours of grief, die neither mother, wife, nor England's queen. Have done thy charm, thou hateful, withered Oh, hatter. leave out thee. Stay, dog, for thou shalt hear me. If heaven have any grievous plague in store, exceeding those that I can wish upon thee, oh, let them keep it till thy sins be ripe, and then hurl down their indignation on thee, the troubler of the poor world's peace. The worm of conscience still be gnaw thy soul. Thy friends suspect for traitors while thou livest, and take deep traitors for thy dearest friends. Let no sleep close up that deadly eye of thine, unless it be with some tormenting dream. Affrights thee with a hell of ugly devils. Thou elvish marked abortive, rooting hog! <laughs> thou that was sealed in thy nativity, the slave of nature and the son of hell! Thou slander of thy mother's heavy womb, thou loathed issue of my father's loins, thou rag of honor, thou detested! Barbara. Richard? Hmm? I call thee not. I cry thee mercy then, for I had thought that thou hadst called me all these bitter names. Why, so did I, but looked for no reply. Oh, let me make the period to my curse. It is done by me, and ends in Margaret. How shall you breathe your curse against yourself? Oh, poor painted queen, vain flourish of my fortune. Why strewest thou sugar on that bottled spider, whose web, deadly web, ensnareth thee about? Fool, fool, thou wouldst a knife to kill thyself. The time will come when thou shalt wish for me to help thee curse that poisonous bunchbacked toad. False boding woman, end thy frantic curse, lest to thy harm thou move our patience. Thou shame upon you. You have all moved mine. Witness, my son, now in the shade of death, whose bright outshining beams thy cloudy wrath hath an eternal darkness folded up. Your airy buildeth in our airy's nest. O oh God that ceased, do not suffer it, as it was one with blood lost, be it so. Have done for shame, if not for charity. Thou oh, urge neither charity nor shame to me. Uncharitably with me have you dealt, and shamefully you, by you my hopes are butchered. 
my charity is outrage, life my shame, and in that shame still live my sorrow's rage. Have done, have done. Oh, princely Buckingham, I'll kiss thy hand in sign of league and amity with thee. Thy garments are not spotted with our blood. Oh, Buckingham, take heed of yonder dog. Look, when he fawns, he bites. And when he bites, his venom tooth will rankle to the death. Have not to do with him. Beware of him. Sin, death, and hell have set their marks on him, and all their ministers attend on him. What doth she say, my lord of Buckingham? Nothing that I respect, my gracious lord. Mm. <sighs> what? Dost thou scorn me for my gentle counsel? And sue the devil that I warned thee from? Oh, but remember this another day, when he shall split thy very heart with sorrow and say, Poor Margaret was a prophetess! <laughs> Leave each of you the subjects to his hate, and he to yours and all of you to God's. <sighs> My hair doth stand on end to hear her curses. And so doth mine, I muse why she's at liberty. I cannot blame her. By God's holy mother, she hath had too much wrong. And I repent my part thereof that I've done to her. I never did her any, to my knowledge. But you have old advantage of her wrong. I was too hot to do somebody good that is too cold in thinking of it now. Mary, as for Clarence, he is well repaid. He is franked up too fatting for his pains. God pardon them that are the cause of it. A virtuous and Christian-like conclusion, to pray for them that have done scathe to us. So do I ever. Being well advised, for had I cursed now, I had cursed against myself. Madam, his majesty doth call for you, and for your grace, and you, my noble lords. We come. Lords, will you go with us? Madam, we will attend your grace. I do the wrong. And first begin to brawl the secret mischiefs that I set at broach to lay unto the grievous charge of others. Clarence, whom I indeed have laid in darkness, I do beweep to many simple goals, namely to Hastings, Derby, Buckingham, and say it is the Queen and her allies that stirred the King against the Duke, my brother. Now they believed it, and withal wet me to be revenged on rivers. But then I sigh, and with a piece of scripture, tell them that God bids us do good for evil. Oh, but soft, here comes my executioners. How now, my hearty stout resolved mates, are you now going to dispatch this deed? We are, my lord, and come to have the warrant that we may be admitted where he is. Oh, well thought upon. I have it here about me. <clears throat> when you have done, repair to Crosby Place, but sirs, be sudden in the execution, for Clarence is well-spoken, and perhaps may move your hearts to pity if you mark him. <laughs> Tush, fear not, my lord. We will not stand a prate. Talkers are no good doers. Be assured, we come to use our hands and not our tongues. Your eyes drop millstones when fools' eyes drop tears. I like you, lads. About your business straight. Go, go, dispatch! We will, my noble lord. Scene four, London, the Tower. Why looks your grace so heavily today? Oh, I have passed a miserable night, so full of ugly sights, of ghastly dreams, that as I am a Christian faithful man, I would not spend another such a night, though t'were to buy a world of happy days. So full of dismal terror was the time. What was your dream? I long to hear you tell it. Methoughts that I had broken from the tower, and was embarked across to Burgundy, and in my company my brother Gloucester, who from my cabin tempted me to walk. As we paced along, upon the giddy footing of the hatches, methought that Gloucester stumbled, and in falling struck me thought to stay him overboard into the tumbling billows of the main. Lord, Lord, methought, what pain it was to drown. 
What dreadful noise of waters in my ears! What ugly sights of death within mine eyes! Methought I saw a thousand fearful wrecks, ten thousand men that fishes gnawed upon, wedges of gold, great anchors, heaps of pearl, inestimable stones, unvalued jewels, all scattered in the bottom of the sea. Some lay in dead men's skulls, and, and in those holes, where eyes did once inhabit, there were crept as twere in scorn of eyes, reflecting gems, which wooed the slimy bottom of the deep, and mocked the dead bones that lay scattered by. Had you such leisure in the time of death to gaze upon the secrets of the deep? Methought I had, and often did I strive to yield the ghost, but still the envious flood kept in my soul and would not let it forth to seek the empty, vast, and wandering air, but smothered it within my panting bulk, which almost burst to belch it in the sea. Oh, awaked you not with this sore agony? Oh, no. My dream was lengthened after life. Oh, then began the tempest to my soul, who passed me thought the melancholy flood with that grim fairy man which poets write of unto the kingdom of perpetual night. The first that there did greet my stranger soul was my great father-in-law, renowned Warwick, who cried aloud, What scourge for perjury can this dark monarchy afford false Clarence? Seize on him, furies, take him to your torments. With that, methoughts, a legion of foul fiends environed me about and howled in my ears such hideous cries that with the very noise I trembling waked, and for a season after could not believe but that I was in hell. Oh, such terrible impression made the dream. No marvel, my lord, though it affrighted you. I promise I am afraid to hear you tell it. Oh, Brackenbury, I, I have done those things, which now bear evidence against my soul, for Edward's sake, and see how he requites me. Oh, God, if my deep prayers cannot appease thee, but thou wilt be avenged on my misdeeds, yet execute thy wrath in me alone. Oh, spare my guiltless wife, my poor children. I pray thee, gentle keeper, stay by me. My soul is heavy, and I fain would sleep. I, I will, my lord. God, give your grace good rest. Sorrow breaks seasons and reposing hours, makes the night morning and the noontide night. Princes have but their tides for their glories, and outward honor for an inward toil, and for unfelt imagination. They often feel a world of restless cares, so that betwixt their tides and low names, there's nothing differs but the outward fame. Oh, who's here? In God's name, what are you? I would speak... How came you hither? I would speak with Clarence, and I came hither on my legs. Yea, are you so brief? Oh, sir, <clears throat> it is better to be brief than tedious. Show him our commission. Talk no more. I am in this commanded to deliver the noble Duke of Clarence to your hands. I will not reason what is meant hereby, because I will be guiltless of the meaning. Here are the keys. There sits the Duke asleep. Halt to the king and signify to him that thus I have resigned my charge to you. Do so. It is a point of wisdom. Fare you well. Come. Shall we do this gear? Take him over the costard with the hilt of thy sword, and then we'll chop him in the Malmsey butt in the next room. Hush! He stirs! Should I strike? No, 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 no. Let's, let's reason with him. Where art thou, keeper? Give me a cup of wine. You shall have wine enough, my lord anon. In God's name, what art thou? Your eyes do menace me. Why look you pale? Who sent you hither? Wherefore do you come? To, to, to murder me? 
Aye. Aye. You scarcely have the hearts to tell me so, and therefore cannot have the hearts to do it. Wherein, my friends, have I offended you? Offended us you have not, but the king. I shall be reconciled to him again. Never, my lord, therefore prepare to die. Thy brother's love, our duty, and thy fault provoke us hither now to slaughter thee. Oh, if you love my brother, hate not me. I am his brother, and I love him well. If you be hired for me, go back again, and I will send you to my brother Gloucester, who shall reward you better for my life than Edward will for tidings of my death. You are deceived. Your brother Gloucester hates you. Oh, no, he loves me, and he holds me dear. Go you to him from me, tell him, when that our princely father York blessed his three sons with his victorious arm, and charged us from his soul to love each other, he little thought of this divided friendship. Bid Gloucester think on this, and he will weep. <laughs> Ay, millstones, as be lessened us to weep. Oh, do not slander him, for he is kind. Right, as snow in harvest. Thou deceivest thyself. Tis he that sent us hither now to slaughter thee. It cannot be, for when I parted with him, he hugged me in his arms, and swore with sobs that he would labor my delivery. Make peace with God, for thou must die, my lord. Hast thou that holy feeling in thy soul, to counsel me to make my peace with God? And art thou yet so, to thy soul, so blind that thou wilt war with God by murdering me? My friend, I spy some pity in thy looks. Oh, if thine eye be not a flatterer, come thou on my side, and entreat for me, as you would beg were you in my distress. A begging prince, what beggar pities not? Take that! And that! If all this will not do, I'll drown you in the mounds of butt within. Act two, scene one, London, the palace. <coughs> Why so? Now have I done a good day's work. You peers, continue this united league. I every day accept an embassage from my Redeemer to redeem me hence. And now in peace my soul shall part to heaven, since I have set my friends at peace on earth. Rivers and Hastings, take each other's hand. Dissemble not your hatred, swear your love. By heaven my heart is purged from grudging hate, and with my hand I seal my true heart's love. So thrive I, as truly swear the like. Take heed you dally not before your king, lest he that is the supreme king of kings confound your hidden falsehood, and award either of you to be the other's end. Madam, yourself are not exempt in this, Buckingham, nor you. You have been factious one against the other, wife. Love, Lord Hastings, let him kiss your hand, and what you do, do it unfeignedly. Here, Hastings, I will never more remember our former hatred. So thrive I and mine. Now, princely Buckingham, seal thou this league with thy embracements to my wife's allies, and make me happy in your unity. Whenever Buckingham doth turn his hate on you or yours, but with all duteous love doth cherish you and yours, God punish me with hate in those where I expect most love. When I have most need to employ a friend with hate in those where I expect most love, and most assured that he is a friend, deep, hollow, treacherous, and full of guile be he unto me. This do I beg of God but I am cold in zeal to yours. A pleasing cordial, princely Buckingham, <coughs> is this vow unto my sickly heart. 
There wanteth now our brother Gloucester here to make the perfect period of this peace. And in good time, here comes the noble duke. Good morrow to my sovereign king and queen and princely peers, a happy time of day. Happy indeed, as we have spent the day. Brother, we have done deeds of charity, made peace, enmity, fair love of hate between these swelling, wrong incensed peers. A, a blessed labor, my most sovereign liege. If I unwittingly or in my rage have aught committed that is hardly borne by any in this presence, uh, I desire to reconcile me to his friendly peace. Tis death to, be, to me to be at enmity. I hate it and desire all good men's love. First, madam, I entreat true peace of you, which I will purchase with my duteous service. Of you, my noble cousin Buckingham, if ever any grudge were lodged between us, of you, Lord Rivers, that without desert have frowned on me, dukes, earls, lords, gentlemen, indeed, of all. I do not know that Englishmen alive with whom my soul is any jot at odds, more than the infant that is born tonight. I thank my God for my humility. A holy day shall this be kept hereafter. I would to God all stripes were well compounded. My sovereign liege, I do beseech your majesty to take our brother Clarence to your grace. Why, madam, have I offered love for this to be so bouted in this royal presence? Who knows not that the noble duke is dead? Dead? De De what? You do him injury to scorn his course. Who knows not he is dead? Who knows he is? Oh, seeing heaven, what a world is this? Is Clarence dead? The order was reversed. But he, poor soul, by your first order died, and that a winged mercury did bear. Some tardy cripple bore the counterman that came to lag to see him buried. A boon, my sovereign, for my service is done. I pray thee peace, my soul is full of sorrow. I will not rise unless your highness grant. Then speak at once what is it thou demandst. The forfeit sovereign of my servant's life, who slew today a righteous gentleman, lately attended on the Duke of no Norfolk. Have I a tongue to doom my brother's death? And shall the same give pardon to a slave? My brother slew no man. His fault was thought, and yet his punishment was cruel death. Who sued to me for him? Who, in my rage, kneeled at my feet and bade me be advised? Who spake of brotherhood? Who spake of love? Who told me, in the field by Tewkesbury, when Oxford had me down, he rescued me and said, Dear brother, live and be a king? Who told me, when we both lay in the field, frozen almost to death, and how he did lap me even in his own garments, and gave himself all thin and naked to the numb cold night. All this from my remembrance, brutish wrath, sinfully plucked, and not a man of you had so much grace to put it in my mind. <coughs> but when your carters or your waiting vassals have done a drunken slaughter and defaced the precious image of our dear Redeemer, you straight are on your knees for pardon. Pardon. And I, unjustly too, must grant it you. But for my brother, not a man would speak nor I, ungracious, speak unto <coughs> for him, poor soul. The proudest of you all have been beholding to him in his life, yet none of you would once plead for his life. <coughs> oh, oh, God, oh, I fear thy justice will take hold on me and you and mine and yours for this. Come, Hastings, help me to my closet. Oh, poor Clarence. <laughs> this is the fruit of rashness. 
March you not how that guilty kindred of the queen looked pale when they did hear of Clarence's death? <laughs> they did urge it still unto the king. God will revenge it. But come, let us in to comfort Edward with our company. We wait upon your grace. Scene two, the palace. Tell me, good grandam, is our father dead? Why do you wring your hands and beat your breast and cry, O oh, Clarence, my unhappy son? Why do you look on us and shake your head and call us wretches, orphans, castaways, if that our noble father be alive? My pretty cousins, you mistake me much. I do lament the sickness of the king, as loath to lose him, not your father's death. It were lost sorrow to wail one that's already lost. Then grand him, you conclude that he is dead. The king my uncle is to blame for this. God will revenge it, whom I will importune with daily prayers all to that effect. And so will I. Peace, children, peace. The king doth love you well. You cannot guess who caused your father's death. Grand him, we can. For my good uncle Gloucester told me the king, provoked by the queen, devised impeachments to imprison him. And when my uncle told me so, he wept, and hugged me in his arm, and kindly kissed my cheek, bade me rely on him as on my father, and he would love me dearly as his child. Oh, that deceit should steal such gentle shapes, and with a virtuous wizard hide foul guile. Oh, who shall hinder me to wail and weep, to chide my fortune and torment myself? I'll join with black despair against my soul and to myself become an enemy. What means this scene of rude impatience? Edward, my lord, your son, our king is dead. Why grow the branches now the root is withered? Why wither not the leaves, the sap being gone? If you will live, lament. If die, be brief, that our swift-winged souls may catch the kings. Uh, so much interest have I in thy sorrow, as I had title in thy noble husband. I have bewept a worthy husband's death, and lived by looking on his images. But now two mirrors of his princely semblance are cracked in pieces by malignant death. And I have for comfort but one false glass, which grieves me when I see my shame in him. Thou art a widow, yet thou art a mother, and hast the comfort of thy children left thee. But death hath snatched my husband from mine arms, and plucked two crutches from my feeble limbs, Edward and Clarence. Oh, what cause have I, thine being but a multi of my grief, to overgo thy plaints Good and my Good you what not for our father's death. Oh, fatherless distress was left unknown. Your widow dolor likewise be unwept. <laughs> No help in lamentation. I am not barren to bring forth complaints. All springs reduce their currents to mine eyes. That I, being governed by the watery moon, may send forth plenteous tears to drown the world. Oh, for my husband, for my dear Lord Edward. Oh, for oh, our father, Edward. for our dear oh, Lord Clarence. Dear Lord Alas, I am the mother of these moans. Their woes are parceled, mine are general. She for an Edward weeps, so do I. These babes for Clarence weep, and so do I. Alas, you three on me, threefold distressed, pour all your tears. I am your sorrow's nurse, and I will pamper it with language. Madam, bethink you, like a careful mother of the young prince, your son, send straight for him. Let him be crowned. In him your comfort lives. Drown desperate sorrow in dead Edward's grave. And plant your joys in living Edward's throne. Madam, have comfort. All of us have cause to wail the dimming of our shining star, but none can cure their harms by wailing them. Madam, my mother, I, I do cry you mercy. I did not see your grace. Humbly on my knee, I crave your blessing. God bless thee, and put meekness in thy mind. Love, charity, obedience, and true duty. Amen, and make me die a good old man. That is the butt end of a mother's blessing. I marvel why her grace did leave it out. You cloudy princes and harsh sorrowing peers that bear this mutual heavy load of moan. Now, 
cheer each other in each other's love. Though we have spent our harvest of this king, we are to reap the harvest of his son. It seemeth good that with some little train, forthwith from Ludlow, the young prince be fetched hither to London to be crowned our king. And so in me, and so I think in all. Then be it so, and go we to determine who they shall be that straight shall post to Ludlow. Madam, and you, my mother, will you go to give your censures in this weighty business? With all our hearts. My lord, whoever journeys to the prince, for God's sake, let not us two be behind. For by the way, I'll sort occasion as index to the story we late talked of to part the queen's proud kindred from the king. <laughs> my other self. My counsel's counsel story, my oracle, my prophet. <laughs> <laughs> my dear cousin, I, like a child, will go by thy direction. Towards Ludlow, then, for we'll not stay behind. Scene three, London, the palace. Last night, I hear, they lay at Northampton. At Stony Stratford will they be tonight. Tomorrow or next day, they will be here. Oh, I long with all my heart to see the prince. I hope he is much grown since I last saw him. But I hear no. They say my son of York have almost ordained him and his grow. Ay, mother, but I would not have it so. Why, my young cousin, it is good to grow. Grandam, one night as we did sit at supper, my uncle Rivers talked how I did grow more than my brother. I quoth my uncle Gloucester, small herbs have grace, great weeds do grow apace, and since, methinks I would not grow so fast, because sweet flowers are slow, and weeds make haste. Good faith, good faith, the saying did not hold in him that did object the same to thee. He was the wretchedest thing when he was young, so long a-growing and leisurely, that if this rule were true, he should be gracious. Why, madam, so no doubt he is. <laughs> I hope he is, but yet let mothers doubt. Oh, now, by, by my troth, if I had been remembered, I could have given my uncle's grace a flout to touch his growth nearer than he touched mine. How, my pretty York, I pray thee, let me hear it. Mary, they say my uncle grew so fast that he could gnaw a crust at two hours old. T'was full two years, ere could I get a tooth. Grandam, this would have been a biting jest. Well, this boy, go to, you're too shrewd. But, madam, be not angry with the child. Richards have ears. Here, here comes the Lord Dorset. What news? Such news, my lord, as grieves me to unfold. How fares the prince? Well, madam, and in health. What is thy news, then? Lord Rivers is sent to Pomfret. Who hath committed him? The mighty dukes, Gloucester and Buckingham. But what offence? Some of all I can I have disclosed. Why or for what these nobles were committed is all unknown to me, my gracious Pardon lady. Me. I see the downfall of our house. The tiger now hath seized the gentle hind and salting tyranny begins to jet upon the innocent and all is thrown. Welcome destruction, death and massacre. I see, as in a map. The end of all. Come. Come, my boy, we will to sanctuary, madam. Farewell. I'll go along with you. You have no cause. Come, I'll conduct you to the sanctuary. Act three, scene one. London, a street. Welcome, sweet prince, to London, to your chamber. Welcome, dear cousin. My thought, sovereign, the weary way hath made you melancholy. No, uncle, but our crosses on the way have made it tedious, wearisome, and heavy. I want more uncles here to welcome me. Oh, oh sweet prince, the untainted virtue of your years hath not yet dived into the world's deceit. No more can you distinguish of a man than of his outward show, which God, he knows, seldom or never jumpeth with the heart. Those uncles which you want were dangerous. Your grace attended to their sugared words, but looked not upon the poison of their hearts. God keep you from them and from such false friends. God keep me from false friends, but they were none. My lord, the mayor of London comes to greet you. 
God bless your grace with health and happy days. I thank you, good my lord, and thank you all. I thought my mother and my brother York would long ere this have met us on the way. By what a slug is Hastings that he comes not to tell us whether they will come or no. Ah, and in good time, here comes the sweating lord. Welcome, my lord. What, will our mother come? On what occasion, God he knows not I, your queen, your mother, and your brother York have taken sanctuary. The tender prince would fain have come to me to meet your grace, but by his mother would perforce withheld. Fie! What an indirect and peevish course is this of hers. Lord Cardinal, will your grace persuade the queen to send the Duke of York unto his princely brother presently? If she deny, Lord Hastings, go with him, and from her jealous arms pluck him perforce. My Lord of Buckingham, if my weak oratory can from his mother win the Duke of York, anon expect him here. But if she be obdurate to mild entreaties, God in heaven forbid we should infringe the holy privilege of blessed sanctuary. Not for all this land would I be guilty of so deep a sin. You are too senseless, obstinate, my lord, too ceremonious and traditional. You break not sanctuary in seizing him. The benefit thereof is always granted to those whose dealings have deserved the place, and those who have the wit to claim the place. Now the prince hath neither claimed it nor deserved it, and therefore, in mine opinion, cannot have it. Then, taking him from thence that is not there, you break no privilege nor charter there. Oft have I heard of sanctuary men, sanctuary children, <laughs> ne'er till now. <laughs> my lord, you shall all rule my mind for once. Come, Lord Hastings, will you go with me? I go, my lord. Good lords, make all the speedy haste you may. Say, Uncle Gloucester, if our brother come, where shall we sojourn till our coronation? Uh, where it seems best unto your royal self. If I may counsel you, some day or two your highness shall repose to the tower, then where you please, and shall be thought most fit for your best health and recreation. I do not like the tower of any place. Did Julius Caesar build that place, my lord? He did, my gracious lord, begin that place, which since succeeding ages have re-edified. Is it upon record, or else reported successively from age to age, he built it? Upon record, my gracious lord. But say, my lord, it were not registered. Methinks the truth should live from age to age, as twere retailed to all posterity, even to the general all-ending day. The wise so young, they say, never do live long. What say you, uncle? Uh, I say, without characters, fame lives long. <laughs> Thus, like the form of vice iniquity, I moralize two meanings in one word. That Julius Caesar was a famous man. Death makes no conquest of this conqueror. For now he lives in fame, though not in life. Now, in good time, here comes the Duke of York. <laughs> Richard of York, how fares our loving brother? Well, my dread lord, so must I call you now. How fares our cousin, noble lord of York? I thank you, gentle uncle. Oh, my lord, you said that idle weeds are fast in growth. The prince, my brother, hath outgrown me far. <laughs> he hath, my lord. And therefore is he idle? Oh, my fair cousin, I must not say so. <sighs> then is he more beholding to you than I? You may command me as my sovereign, but you have power in me as in a kinsman. I pray you, uncle. Give me this dagger. Oh, a beggar, brother. Of my kind uncle that I know will give. And being but a toy, which is no grief to give. A greater gift than that I'll give to my cousin. A greater gift? Oh, that's the sword what? to it. Would you have my weapon, little lord? I would that I might thank you as you call me. How? Little. <laughs> My Lord of York will still be cross and talk. Uncle, your grace knows how to bear with me. You mean to bear me, not to bear with me? Uncle, my brother Bach mocks both you and me because that I am little like an ape, he thinks that you should bear me on your shoulders. Mm, my Lord, will it please you pass along? 
Myself and my good cousin Buckingham will to your mother to entreat of her to meet you at the tower and warn you. Will you go into the tower, my lord? My lord protector needs will have it so. I shall not sleep in quiet at the tower. Why? What should you fear? Mary, my uncle Clarence is a ghost. My granddam told me he was murdered there. I fear no uncle's dead. Nor none that live, I hope. <laughs> and if they live, I hope I need not fear. But come, my lord, and go with a heavy heart, thinking on them, go I unto the tower. Think you, my lord, this little prating York was not incensed by his subtle mother to taunt and scorn you thus appropriately? No doubt, no doubt. Oh. Tis a parlous boy, bold, quick, ingenious, forward, capable. He is all the mothers from top to toe. Well, let them rest. Come hither, Catesby. Thou art sworn as deeply to affect what we intend, as closely to conceal what we impart. What thinkst thou? Is it not an easy matter to make William Lord Hastings of our mind for the installment of this noble duke in the seat royal of this famous isle? He, for his father's sake, so loves the prince, that he will not be one to aught against him. What thinkst thou then of Stanley? What will he? He will do all in all as Hastings doth. Well then, no more but this. Go, gentle Catesby, and as it were far off sound thou, Lord Hastings, how doth he stand affected to our purpose, and summon him tomorrow to the tower to sit about the coronation. If thou dost find him tractable to us, encourage him, show him all our reasons. Yeah. If he be leaden, icy cold, unwilling, be thou so too, and so break off your talk, and give us notice of his inclination. For we tomorrow hold divided counsels, wherein thyself shalt highly be employed. Commend me to Lord William. Tell him, Catesby, his ancient knot of dangerous adversaries tomorrow are let blood at Pomfret Castle. Mm. Good, Catesby, go, effect this business soundly. My good lords both, with all the heed I may. Now, my lord, what shall we do if we perceive Lord Hastings will not yield to our complots? Chop off his head, man. Somewhat we will do. And look, when I am king, claim thou of me the earldom of Hereford, and the movables whereof the king my brother stood possessed. I'll claim that promise at your grace's hands. And look to have it yielded with all willingness. Come, let us sup betimes, that afterwards we may digest our complots in some form. Scene two, before Lord Hastings' house. What ho, my lord! At the door. A messenger from the Lord Stanley. <sighs> What is the clock? On the stroke of four. Canest thy master sleep with his tedious nights? So it should seem by that I have to say. He dreamt tonight the boar had raised his helm. Besides, he says there are two councils held, and that may be determined at the one, which may make you and him to rue at the other. Therefore he sends to know your lordship's pleasure, if presently you will take horse with him, and with all speed post with him toward the north, to shun the danger that his soul divides. Go, oh, fellow, return unto thy lord. Bid him not fear the separated councils. His honor and myself are at the one, and the other is my servant Catesby, where nothing that proceed can touch us. Therefore, I say, I shall not have intelligence, and, and for his, his dreams, I, I wonder why he is so fond to trust the mockery of unquit slumbers. Go, bid thy master rise and come to me, and we will both go on to the tower, where he shall see the boar will use us kindly. My gracious lord, I'll tell him what you say. Many good morrows to my noble lord. Oh, good morrow, Catesby. You are early stirring. <laughs> What news, what news uh, in this our tottering state? It is a reeling world indeed, my lord. And I believe twill never stand upright till Richard wear the garland of the realm. 
How? Where the garland? Dost thou mean the crown? Ay, my good lord. I'll have this crown of mine cut off from my shoulders ere I see the crown so foul misplaced. But canst thou guess he does aim at it? Ay, on my life, and hopes to find forward upon his party for the gain thereof. And thereupon he sends you this good news, that this very day your enemies, the kindred of the queen, must die at Pomfret. Indeed, I am no mourner for that news, because they have been still mine enemies. But that'll give my voice on Richard's side to bar thy master's heirs in true descent. God knows I will not do it to the death. God keep your lordship in that gracious mind. But I shall laugh at this twelve month hence, that they who brought me here in my master's hate, I live to look upon their tragedy. <laughs> I tell thee, Catesby. What, my lord? Ere a fortnight make me elder, ere I'll send some packing that yet think not on it. Tis a vile thing to die, my gracious lord, when men are unprepared and look not for it. Oh, monstrous, monstrous, and so falls out with rivers, and so it will do with some men else, who think themselves are safe as thou and I, who, <laughs> as thou knowest, are dear to princely Richard and Buckingham. The princes make high account of you, for they account his head upon the bridge. I know they do, and I have well deserved it. <laughs> Come on, where's your boar spear, man? Fear you the boar and go so unprovided? My lord, good morrow. Good morrow, Catesby. You may jest on, but by the holy rood, I, I do not like these several counsels, I. Thank you, but that I know our state's secure. I would be so triumphant as I am. The lords at Pomfret, when they rode from London, were jocund and supposed their state was so sure, and yet indeed had no cause to mistrust, but yet you see how soon the day is o'ercast. This sudden stag of rancor I misdoubt. Pray God, I, I prove to be a needless coward. What, shall we to the tower? The day is spent. Come, come, have with you. What do you want, my lord? Today, the lords you talk of are beheaded. They, for their truth, might better wear their heads than some that have accused them wear their hats. But come, my lord, let us away. I'll wait upon your lordship. Scene three, Pomfret Castle. Sir Richard Radcliffe, let me tell thee this. Today thou behold a subject die for truth, for duty, and for loyalty. God keep the prince from all the pack of you, or not you are of damned bloodsuckers. <laughs> that, the limit of your life is out. Oh, Pomfret, Pomfret, oh thy bloody prison and fatal, ominous to noble peers. Now Margaret's curse is falling upon my head for standing by when Richard stabbed her son. Then curse it she Hastings, then curse it she Buckingham, then curse it she Richard. Oh, remember God to hear her prayers for them, as now for us and for my sister and for her princely sons. Be satisfied, dear God, with our true blood. Which, as thou knowest, unjustly must be spilt. Make haste! The hour of death is expiate. Scene 4. The Tower of London. My lords! <laughs> <laughs> My lords! At once! The cause why we are met is to determine the coronation. In God's name, speak. When is the royal day? Are all things fitting for that royal time? It is, and, and once but nomination. Tomorrow, then, I judge, will be a happy day. Uh, who knows the Lord Protector's mind herein? Who is most inward with the royal duke? Your grace, uh, we think you should soonest know his mind. <laughs> who, I, my lord? I, we, we know each other's faces, but for our hearts, he knows no more of mine than I of yours, nor I no more of his than you of mine. Uh, Lord Hastings, you and he are near in love. 
I thank his grace, I know he loves me well. But for his purpose in the coronation, I have not sounded him, nor he delivered his gracious pleasure in any way there within. But you, my noble lords, may name a time. And in the Duke's behalf, I'll give my voice, which I presume he'll take in gentle part. Oh, now in good time, the Duke comes himself. My noble lords and cousins all, good morrow. I have been long a sleeper, but I hope my absence doth neglect no great designs which by my presence might have been concluded. Had you not come upon your cue, my lord, William Lord Hastings had pronounced your part. Uh, I mean, your voice for crowning of the king. Then, my lord Hastings, no man might be bolder. His lordship knows me well and loves me well. Cousin of Buckingham, a, a word with you? Catesby has sounded Hastings in our business and finds the testy gentleman so hot as he will lose his head ere he gives consent. His master's son, as worshipful as he turned, shall lose the royalty of England's throne. Withdraw you hence, my lord. I'll follow you. His grace looks cheerfully and smooth today. <laughs> There's some conceit or other likes him well. When he doth bid good morrow with such a spirit, <laughs> I think there is never a man in Christendom that can less hide his love or hate than he. <laughs> or by his face, you shall know exactly his heart. What of his heart perceive you in his face by any likelihood he showed today? Mary, that with no man here he is offended. For were he, he had shown it in his looks. <laughs> I pray God he not be, I say. I pray you all, tell me me what they deserve that do conspire my death with devilish plots of damned witchcraft, and that have prevailed upon my body with their hellish charms. <laughs> the tender love I bear your grace, my lord, makes me most forward in this noble presence to doom the offenders. Wherever they shall be, I, I say, my lord, they have deserved death. Then be your eyes the witness of this ill. See how I am bewitched. Behold, mine arm is like a blasted sapling, withered up. And this is Edward's wife, that monstrous witch, consorted with that harlot strumpet chore, that by their witchcraft thus have marked me. If they have done this thing, my gracious lord. Am I thou protected of this damned strumpet? Tell Tellest thou me of ifs? Thou art a traitor. Off with his head. Now by St. Paul I swear, I will not dine until I see the same. Ratcliffe, look that it be done. The rest that love me, rise and follow me. Woe! Woe for England, not a whit for me. For I too fond might have prevented this. Stanley, did thy dream the board did raise his helm? But then I disdained it and did scorn to fly. Oh, Margaret, Margaret, now thy heavy curse is lighted upon poor Hastings' wretched head. Come, come, dispatched his bootless to exclaim. Come, lead me to the block, bear him my head. They shall smile at me that shortly shall be dead. Who's so blind, but says he sees it not? Bad is the world and all will come to naught, when such bad dealings must be seen and thought. Scene six, Baynard's Castle. Will not the mayor then and his brethren come? The mayor is here at hand, in tensome fear. Be not you spoke with but by mighty suit. And look you, get a prayer book in your hand, uh -huh. and stand betwixt two churchmen, good my lord, for on that ground I'll build a holy desk hand. And be not easily won to our request. Play the maid's part, still answer nay, and take it. I go, and if you plead as well for them as I can say nay to thee for myself, no doubt we'll bring it to a happy issue. Go, go, up to the leads, the Lord Mayor knocks.
Welcome, my lord. I dance attendance here. I think the duke will not be spoke with all. Oh, here comes his servant. How now, Catesby? What says he? My lord, he doth entreat your grace to visit him tomorrow or the next day. He is within, with two right reverend fathers, and no worldly suit would he be moved to draw him from his holy exercise. Return, good Catesby, to thy lord again. Tell him myself, the mayor, and the citizens, in deep designs and matters of great moment, are come to have some conference with his grace. I'll tell him what you say, my lord. <laughs> my lord, this prince is not an Edward. He is not lolling on a lewd day bed, but on his knees at meditation, not dallying with a brace of courtesans, but meditating with two deep divines. Ooh. Happy were England would this gracious prince take on himself the sovereignty thereof. Mary, God forbid his grace should say us nay. Oh, how now, Catesby? What says your lord? My lord, he fears you mean no good to him. Oh, sorry I am my noble cousin should suspect me that I mean no good to him. By heaven, I come in perfect love to him. So, once more, return and tell his grace. When holy and devout religious men are at their beads, tis hard to draw them thence. So sweet is zealous contemplation. See where he stands between two clergymen. <laughs> Famous Plantagenet, most gracious prince, lend favorable ears to our request and pardon us the interruption of thy right devotion and right Christian zeal. My lord, there needs no such apology. I rather do beseech you pardon me, who, earnest in the service of my God, neglect the visitation of my friends. But leaving this, what is your grace's pleasure? Even that I hope which pleaseth God above and all good men of this ungoverned isle. Yeah! yeah. I do suspect I have done some offense that seems disgracious in the city's eyes. You have, my lord. Would it might please your grace at our entreaties to amend that fault? Else wherefore breathe I in a Christian land? Then no. It is your fault that you resign the supreme seat, the throne majestical the sceptered office of your ancestors, the lineal glory of your royal house, to the corruption of a blemished stock. This noble isle doth want her proper limbs, her face defaced with scars of infamy, her royal stock graft with ignoble plants and almost shouldered in the swallowing gulf of blind forgetfulness and dark oblivion. Yeah. 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 Which to recure, we heartily solicit your gracious self to take on you the charge and kingly government of this your land. Yeah! yeah. Not as protector, steward, substitute, or lowly factor for another's gain, but as successively, from blood to blood, your right of birth, your empery, your own. Woo! I know not whether to depart in silence, or bitterly to speak in your reproof best fitteth my degree or your condition. Definitively thus I answer you, your love deserves my thanks, but my desert unmeritable shuns your high request. The royal tree hath left us royal fruit, which, mellowed by the stealing hours of time, will well become the seat of majesty, and make, no doubt, us happy by his reign. No. no. My lord, this argues conscience in your grace. You say that Edward is your brother's son. So say we too, but not by Edward's wife. For first, he was contract to Lady Lucy, and afterward by substitute, mm -hmm. betrothed to Bona, sister to the King of France. Mm -hmm. These both put by a poor petitioner a care-crazed mother of a many children, a beauty-waning and distressed widow, made prize and purchase of his lustful eye, seduced the pit and height of all his thoughts to base declension and loathed bigamy. <laughs> By her, in his unlawful bed, he got this Edward, whom our manners term the prince. 
Personally, <laughs> could I expostulate, save that for reverence to some alive? I give a sparing limit to my tongue. Then, good my lord, take to your royal self this preferred benefit of dignity. If none, to bless us in the land with all, yet to draw forth your noble ancestry from the corruption of abusing times unto a lineal, true derived course! <laughs> Do good, my lord, your citizens entreat you! But would you enforce me to a world of care? Since you will buckle fortune on my back to bear her burthen, whether I will or no, I must have patience to endure the load. Then I salute you with this kingly title. Long live Richard, England's royal king! Woo! Yeah! Woo! Yeah! Tomorrow will it please you to be crowned? Even when you please, since you will have it so. Woo! Act four, scene one, before the tower. Daughter, well met. God gave your graces both a happy and joyful time of day. As much to you, good sister, whither you went? No farther than the tower, and as I guess, upon the like devotion as yourselves, to gratulate the gentle princes there. Kind sister, thanks. We'll enter all together. And in good time. Here the lieutenant comes. Master lieutenant, pray you, and by your leave, how doth the prince and my young son of York? Right well, dear madam. Mm -hmm. By your patience, I may not suffer you to visit them. The king hath straightly charged the contrary. The, the king? Why, who's that? I cry you mercy, I, I mean the lord protector. The lord protect him from that kingly title? Hath he set bounds betwixt their love and me? I am their mother, who should keep me from them? I am their father's mother, I will see them. Their aunt, I am in law, in love their mother. Then bring me to their sights, I'll bear thy blame, and take thy office from me on my peril. No! Madam, no, I may not leave it so. I am bound by oath, and therefore pardon me. Uh, Let me but meet you, ladies, uh, one hour hence, and I'll salute your grace of York as mother, and reverend looker-on of two fair queens. Come, madam, you must straight to Westminster, there to be crowned Richard's royal queen. Oh, cut my lace in sunder that my pen heart may have some scope to beat, or else I swoon with this dead killing news. Frightful tidings. Oh, unpleasing news. Give good cheer, mother. How fares your grace? Taurus, it speak not to me. Get thee hence. Death and destruction dog thee at the hills. If thou wilt outstrip death, go cross the seas and live with Richmond from the reach of hell. Go, hide thee. Hide thee from this slaughterhouse, lest thou increase the number of the dead and make me die the thrall of Margaret's course. Nor mother, mother, wife, nor England's counted queen. Full of wise care is your counsel, madam. Take all the swift advantage of the hours. You shall have letters from me to my son to meet you on the way and welcome you. Be not taken tardy by unwise delay. Oh, ill-dispersing wind of misery. Oh, my accursed womb, the bed of death. A cockatrice hast thou hatched to the world whose unavoided eye is murderous. Come, madam, come. I, I was sent in all haste. And I and all unwillingness will go. I would to God that the inclusive verge of golden metal that must round my brow were red hot steel to sear me to the brain. Anointed, let me be with deadly venom and die, ere men can say, God save the queen. Go. Go. 
go, poor soul. I envy not thy glory to feed my humour. Wish thyself no harm. No. Why? When he that is my husband now came to me, as I followed Henry's course, when scarce the blood was well washed from his hands, which issued from my other angel husband, and that dead saint, which then I was weeping, followed. Oh, when I say I looked on Richard's face, this was my wish. Be thou, quoth I, accursed for making me so young, so old a widow. And when thou wedst, let sorrow haunt thy bed. And be thy wife, if any be so mad, as miserable by the life of thee, as thou hadst made me by my dear lord's death. Lo, ere I can repeat this curse again, even in so, so short a space, my woman's heart grossly grew captive to his honey words, and proved the subject of my own soul's curse, which ever since hath kept my eyes from rest. For never yet one hour in his bed have I enjoyed the golden dew of sleep, but have been waked by his timorous dreams. Besides, he hates me from my father Warwick, and will no doubt shortly be rid of me. Poor heart, but you I pity thy complaint. No more than from my soul I mourn for yours. Farewell. Thou oh, woeful welcomer of glory. Adieu, poor soul, that takest thy leave of it. Go thou to Richmond, and good fortune guide thee. Go thou to Richard, and good angels guard thee. Go thou to sanctuary, and good thoughts possess thee. I to my grave, where peace and rest lie with me. Eighty odd years of sorrow have I seen, and each hour's joy wrecked with a week of teen. Stay. Yet, look back with me into the tower. Pity you ancient stones, those tender babes, babes who envy hath immured within your walls. Rough cradle for such little pretty ones. Rude, ragged nurse, old sullen playfellow for tender princes. Use my babies well. So, foolish sorrow bids your stones farewell. Scene two, London, the palace. Stand all apart, cousin of Buckingham. My gracious sovereign. Give me thy hand. Thus, high by thy advice and thy assistance, is King Richard seated. <laughs> But shall we wear these honors for a day, or shall they last and we rejoice in them? Still live they, and forever may they last. Oh, <laughs> Buckingham, now do I play the touch to try if thou be current gold indeed. Young Edward lives. Think now what I would say. Say on, my loving lord. Why, Buckingham, I say I would be king. Right, so you are, my thrice renowned liege. Ha! Am I king? Tis so. But Edward lives. Uh, true, noble prince. Oh, bitter consequence that Edward still should live. True, noble prince. <laughs> oh, cousin, <laughs> that were not wont to be so dull. Shall I be plain? I wish the bastards dead, and I would have it suddenly performed. What sayest thou? Speak suddenly, be brief. Your grace may do your pleasure. Tut, tut, thou art all eyes, thy kindness freezeth. Say, have I thy consent that they shall die? Uh, give, give me some breath, some, some little pause, my lord, before I positively speak in this. I will resolve your grace immediately. King is angry. See, he bites his lip. I will converse with iron-witted fools and unrespected boys. None are for me that look into me with considerate eyes. High-reaching Buckingham grows circumspect. Boy! My lord. Knowest thou not any whom corrupting gold would tempt into a close exploit of death? My lord, I, I know a discontented gentleman whose humble means match not his haughty mind. 
gold were as good as 20 orators and will, no doubt, tempt him to anything. What is his name? His name, my lord, is Tyrell. I partly know the man. Go, call him hither. The deep, revolving, witty Buckingham no more shall be the neighbor to my counsel. Hath he so long held out with me untired, and stops he now for breath? How now? What news with you? My lord, I hear the Marquis Dorset fled to Richmond, in those parts beyond the sea where he abides. Catesby! My lord! Rumor it abroad that Anne, my wife, is sick and like to die. I will take order for her keeping close. Look how thou dreamst, I say again, give out that Anne, my wife, is sick and like to die. About it! For it stands me much upon to stop all hopes whose growth may damage me. Must be married to my brother's daughter, or else my kingdom stands on brittle glass. Murder her brothers and then marry her? Uncertain way of gain. But I am in so far in blood that sin will pluck on sin. Tear falling pity dwells not in this eye. Is thy name Tyrell? James Tyrell, and your most obedient servant. There is thou resolved to kill a friend of mine. Ay, my lord, but I'd rather kill two enemies. Why, there thou hast it. Two deep enemies, foes to my rest and my sweet sleep's disturbers, are they that I would have thee deal upon. Tyrell, I mean those bastards in the tower. Let me have open means to come to them, and I'll soon rid you of the fear of them. Thou sing sweet music. Hark, come hither, Tyrell. Go by this token. Rise and lend thine ear. There is no more but so. Say it is done, and I will love thee and prefer thee too. Tis done, my gracious lord. My lord, I have considered in my mind the late demand that you did sound me in. Well, let that pass. Dorset has fled to Richmond. I hear that news, my lord. Stanley, here's your wife's son well. Look to it. My lord, I claim your gift, my due of promise, for which your honor and your faith is pawned, the earldom of Hereford and the movables the which you promised I should possess. Stanley, look to your wife. If she convey letters to Richmond, you shall answer it. What says your highness to my just demand? As I remember, Henry the Sixth did prophesy that Richmond should be king when Richmond was a little peevish boy. A king, perhaps, perhaps. My lord. Uh, how chess the prophet could not at that time have told me, I being by, that I should kill him? My lord. Aye. What's o'clock? I am thus bold to put your grace in mind of what you promised me. Well, but what's o'clock? Upon the stroke of ten? Well, let it strike. Why let it strike? Because that, like a jack, thou keeps the stroke betwixt thy begging and my meditation. I'm not in the giving vein today. Wait, if, then resolve me whether you, you will or no. <laughs> tut, tut, thou trumpslest me. I'm not in the vein. Is it even so? Rewards he my true service with such deep contempt? Made I him king for this? Oh, let me think on Hastings and be gone to Brecknock while my fearful head is on. Scene three, the same. All hail my sovereign liege. Kind Tyrell, am I happy in thy news? If to have done the thing you gave in charge beget your happiness, be happy then. For it is done, my lord. But didst thou see them dead? I did, my lord. And buried? Gentle Tyro. The chaplain of the tower hath buried them. Come to me, Tyrell, soon and after supper, and thou shalt tell the process of their death. Meantime, but think how I may do thee good, and be inheritor of thy desire. Farewell till soon. The son of Clarence have I pent up close. 
His daughter, meanly, have I matched in marriage. The sons of Edward sleep in Abraham's bosom, and Anne, my wife, hath bid the world good night. My lord. Good news or bad that thou comest in so bluntly? Bad news, my lord. Dorset is fled to Richmond, and Buckingham, backed with the hardy Welshman, is in the field, and still his power increaseth. Dorset with Richmond troubles me more than Buckingham and his rash levied army. Come, muster men. My counsel is my shield. We must be brief when traitors brave the field. Scene four, before the palace. So now prosperity begins to mellow and drop into the rotten mouth of death. <laughs> Here in the slyly confines have I lurked to watch the waning of mine adversaries. I'll withdraw the wretched Margaret. Who comes here? My young princess. Ah, my tender babes, my unblown flowers, new appearing sweet. If yet your gentle souls fly in the air and be not fixed in doom perpetual hover about me with your airy wings and hear your mother's lamentation. So many miseries have craved my voice that my woe-weary tongue is mute and dumb. Edward Plantagenet, why art thou dead? Wilt thou, O oh God, fly from such gentle lambs and throw them in the entrails of a wolf? Blind sight, dead life, poor mortal living ghost. Rest thy unrest on England's lawful earth, unlawfully made drunk with innocence blood. No, oh, that thou wouldst well afford a grave, as thou canst yield a melancholy seat, then would I hide my bones, not rest them here. Oh, who hath any cause to mourn but I? If ancient sorrow be most reverend, give mine the benefit of seniory, and let my woes frown on the upper hand. If sorrow can admit society, tell o'er your woes again by viewing mine. <laughs> I had an Edward until a Richard killed him. I had a Harry until a Richard killed him. Thou hadst an Edward till a Richard killed him. Thou hadst a Richard till a Richard killed him. I had a Richard too, and thou didst kill him. I had a Rutland too, thou hopes to kill him. Thou hadst a Clarence too, and Richard killed him. From forth the kennel of thy womb hath crept a hellhound that doth hunt us all to death. That dog that had his teeth before his eyes to worry lambs and lap their gentle blood, the foul defacer of God's hand he were to thy womb let loose to chase us to our graves. <laughs> Oh, upright, just, and true, disposing God! How do I thank thee that this carnal cur preys on the issue of his mother's body? O oh, Harry's wife, triumph not in my woes. God witness with me, I have wept for thine. Bear with me, I am hungry for revenge, and now I cloy me with beholding it. Thy Edward is dead that stabbed my Edward. Thy other Edward dead to quit my Edward. Thy Clarence, he is dead that killed my Edward. And the beholders of this tragic play, the adulterate Hastings, rivers, untimely smothered in their dusky graves. Richard yet lives, hell's black intelligencer, only reserved their factor to buy souls and send them thither. What at home? At and ensues his piteous and unpitied end. Cancel his bond of life. Dear God, I pray that I may live to say the dog is dead! <laughs> oh, thou didst prophesy the time would come that I should wish for thee to help me curse that bottled spider, that foul bunched back toad! I called thee then vain flourish of my fortune. I called thee then poor shadow, painted queen, the presentation of but what I was. 
Where is thy husband now? Where be thy brothers? Where are thy children? Wherein dost thou joy? Who sues to thee and cries, God save the queen? Decline all this and see what now thou art. For happy wife, a most distressed widow. For joyful mother, one that wails the name. For queen, a very caitiff crowned with care. For one being feared of all, now fearing one. For one commanding all, obeyed of none. Thus hath the course of justice wheeled about, and left thee but a very prey to time. Thou didst usurp my place, and dost thou not usurp the just proportion of my sorrow? <gasps> Farewell, York's wife, and queen of sad mischance. These English woes will make me smile in France. Oh, thou well skilled in curses, stay a while, and teach me how to curse mine enemies. Forbear to sleep nights and fast the days. Compare dead happiness with living woe. Think that thy babes were fairer than they were, and he that slew them fouler than he is. Bettering thy loss makes the bad causer worse. Revolving this will teach you how to curse. Why should calamity be full of words? When the attorneys to their client woes, who are breathing orders of miseries? Let them have scope. Though what they do in part help not all, yet do they ease the heart. If so, then be not tongue-tied, go with me. And in the breath of bitter words, let smother my damned son, which thy two sweet sons smothered. I hear his drum, be copious, and exclaims. Who intercepts my expedition? Oh, she that might have intercepted thee by strangling thee in her accursed womb, from all the slaughters, wretch, that thou hast done. Hidest thou that forehead with a golden crown, where should be graven, if that right were right, the slaughter? Of the prince that owed that crown and the dire death of my two Tell me, thou villain slave, where are my children? Thou toad, thou toad, where is thy brother Clarence? Where is kind Hastings and Rivers? Let not the heavens hear these telltale women rail on the Lord's anointed. Strike, I say! Either be patient and entreat me fair, or with the clamorous report of war, thus will I drown your exclamations. Art thou my son? Aye, I thank God, my father, and yourself. Then patiently hear my impatience. Madam, I have a touch of your condition which cannot brook the accent of reproof. Oh, let me speak. Who then? But I'll not hear. I will be mild and gentle in my speech. And breathe, good mother, for I am in haste. Art thou so hasty? I have stayed for thee, God knows, in anguish, pain, and agony. And came I not at last to comfort you? No, by the holy rood, thou knowst it well. Thou camest on earth to make the earth my hell. A grievous burthen was thy birth to me. Tetchy and wayward was thy infancy. Thy school days, frightful, desperate, wild, and furious. The prime of thy manhood, daring, bold, and venturous. What comfortable hour canst thou name that ever graced me in thy company? If I be so disgracious in your sight, let me march on and not offend your grace. Strike the drum. I prithee, hear me speak. You speak too bitterly. Hear me a word, for I shall never speak to thee again. So? Either thou wilt die by God's just ordinance, ere from this war thou turn a conqueror, or I with grief and extreme age shall perish and never look upon thy face again. Therefore, take with thee my most heavy curse. My prayers on the adverse party fight, and there the little souls of Edward's children whisper the spirits of thine enemies, and promise them success and victory. Bloody thou art, bloody will be thy end. Shame serves thy life, and doth thy death attend. 
the far more cause, yet much less the curse abides in me. Say amen. Say amen. I must speak a word. We have no more sons of the royal blood. You have a daughter called Elizabeth, virtuous and fair, royal and gracious. Must she die for this? Oh, let her live. I'll corrupt her manners, stain her beauty, slander myself as false to Edward's bed. I will confess she was not Why Edward's not daughter. Earth, she is of royal blood. To save her life, I'll say she is not so. Her life is only safest in her birth. And only in that safety died her brother. I do intend more good to you and yours than ever you or yours were by me wronged. What good is covered with the face of heaven to be discovered that can do me good? The advancement of your children, gentle lady? Up to some scaffold, there to lose their heads. No to the dignity and height of honor, the high imperial type of this earth's glory. Tell me, what dignity, what state, what honor canst thou demise to any child of mine? I mean that with my soul I love thy daughter and mean to make her queen of England. Say then, who dost thou mean shall be her king? Even he that makes her queen, who should be else? What, thou? I, even I. What think you of it, madam? Thou canst thou woo her. That would I learn of you, as one that are best acquainted with her humor. And wilt thou learn of me? Madam, with all my heart. Send to her, by the man that slew her brothers, a pair of bleeding hearts. Thereon. Engrave Edward in York, then haply she will weep if this inducement force her not to love. Send her a story of thy noble acts. Tell her thou made a story with her uncle Clarence, her uncle Rivers. Yeah, and for her sake, made us quick conveyance with her good Aunt Anne. Come, come, you mock me. This is not the way to win your daughter. There is no other way unless thou couldst put on some other shape. And not be richer that hath done all this. Say that I did all this for love of her. Say then indeed she cannot truth but hate thee, having bought love with such a bloody spoil. Look, what is done cannot be now amended. Men shall deal unadvisedly sometimes, which after <laughs> hours gives leisure to repent. If I did take the kingdom from your sons to make amends, I'll give it to your daughter. What were I best to say? Her father's brother would be her lord? Or, shall I say, her uncle? Or, he that slew her brothers and her uncles, under what title shall I woo for thee that can make seem pleasing to her tender years? Say she shall be a high and mighty queen. To wail the tide as her mother doth. Say I will love her everlastingly. But how long shall that ever last? How long as heaven and nature lengthens it? So long as hell and Richard likes of it. Your reasons are too shallow and too quick. Oh, no. My reasons are too deep and dead. Too deep and dead, poor infants in their grave. Harp not on that string, madam, that is past. Harp on it shall still I till heartstrings break. Now by my George, my garter, and my crown. Profane, dishonored, and the third usurped. I swear on my life. Swear then by something that thou hast not wronged. Why then by God? God's wrong is most of all. If thou hadst feared, to break an oath by him. The unity the king thy brother made had not been broken, nor my brother slain. If thou hadst feared to break an oath by him. The imperial medal, circling now thy brow, had graced the tender temples of my child. And both the princes had been breathing here, which now, too tender playfellows to dust. Thy broken faith hath made a prey for worm. What canst thou swear by now? As I intend to prosper and repent. 
So thrive I in my dangerous attempt of hostile arms, myself, myself confound. <laughs> Heaven and fortune bar me happy hours. Attend not thy beauteous princely daughter. In her consists my happiness and thine. Without her follows to this land and me, to thee, herself, and many a Christian soul. Death, desolation, ruin, and decay. It cannot be avoided but by this. It will not be avoided but by this. Therefore, good mother, I must ken you so. Be the attorney of my love to her. Plead what I will be, not what I have been. Shall I be tempted of the devil thus? If the devil tempt thee to do good. Shall I forget myself to be myself? I, if yourself's remembrance, wrong yourself. But thou didst kill my children. But in your daughter's womb I bury them. Where in that nest of spicery they shall breed selves of themselves to your comforture. Shall I go win my daughter to your room? And be a happy mother by the deed. I go. I go. Write to me very shortly, and you shall understand from me her mind. Bear her my true love's kiss. And so, farewell. Relenting fool and shallow changing woman. How now, what news? My gracious sovereign, on the western coast rideth a puissant navy. To the shore throng many doubtful, hollow-hearted friends, unarmed and unresolved to beat them back. Tis thought that Richmond is their admiral, and there they hull, expecting but the aid of Buckingham to welcome them ashore. A lightfoot friend post the Duke of Norfolk. Hmm? Radcliffe, thyself, or, or Catesby, where is he? Here, my lord. Fly to the Duke. Post thou to Salisbury when thou comest hither. Dull, unmindful villain, why stand'st thou still and goest not to the Duke? First, mighty sovereign, let me know your mind, from which your grace I shall deliver to him. Oh, true, good Catesby. Um, bid him levy straight the greatest strength and power he can make, and meet me presently at Salisbury. I go. Uh, what is your highness' pleasure I shall do at Salisbury? Why, what wouldst thou do there before I go? Your Highness told me I should post before. My mind has changed, sir. My mind has changed. Oh, now, what news with you? None good, my lord, to, to please you with hearing, nor, nor none so bad that it may well be told. Hoy day, a riddle, neither good nor bad. Why dost thou run so many mile about when thou mayst tell thy tale a nearer way? Once more, what news? Richmond is on the seas. There let him sink and be the seas on him. White-livered runagate, what doth he there? I, I know not, mighty sovereign, but by guess. Well, sir, as you guess, as you guess. Stirred up by Dorset and, and Buckingham, he, he makes for England there to claim the crown. Is the chair empty? Is the sword unswayed? Is the king dead? The empire unpossessed? Well, then tell me, what doth he upon the sea? Unless for that my liege, I cannot guess. Unless for that he comes to be your liege. You cannot guess wherefore the Welshman comes. Thou wilt revolt and fly to him, I fear. No, mighty liege, therefore mistrust me not. Where is thy power then to beat him back? Where are thy tenants and thy followers? Are they not now upon the western shore, safe conducting the rebels from their ships? No, no, my good lord, my friends are in the north. Cold friends to Richard, what do they in the north when they should serve their sovereign in the west? If they have not been commanded, mighty sovereign, please it your majesty to give me leave. I'll muster my friends and meet your grace, where and what time your majesty shall please. Aye, aye. Thou wouldst be gone to join with Richmond. I will not trust you, sir. Most mighty sovereign, you have no cause to hold my friendship doubtful. I, I never was nor never will be false. Well, 
go, Master Men. But hear you, leave behind your son, George Stanley. Look, your faith be firm, or else his head's assurance is but frail. So deal with him as I prove true to you. My liege, the Duke of Buckingham is taken. That is the best news, that the Earl of Richmond is with mighty power landed at Milford is colder tidings. Yet they must be told. Away towards Salisbury. While we reason here, a royal battle might be won and lost. Someone take order, Buckingham be brought to Salisbury. The rest, march on with me. Scene five, Lord Derby's house. My Lord Oxford, tell Richmond this from me, that in the sty of the, of the most bloody boar, my son George Stanley is franked up in hold. If I revolt, off goes young George's head. The fear of that withholds my present aid, but, but tell me, where is princely Richmond now? At Pembroke or at Hartford West in Wales. Return unto thy lord. Uh, commend me to him. Uh, tell him the queen has hardly consented. He shall espouse Elizabeth's daughter. Uh, these letters will resolve him of my mind. Farewell. Act 5, Scene 1. Salisbury, an open place. Will, will not King Richard let me speak with him? No, my good lord. Therefore be patient. Hastings and Edward's children... Rivers, holy King Henry, and thy fair son, Edward, and all that have miscarried by underhand, corrupted, foul injustice, if that your moody, discontented souls do through the clouds behold this present hour, even for revenge, mock my destruction. This is all souls' day, fellow, is it not? It is, my lord. Why then? All Souls' Day is my body's doomsday. This is the day that in King Edward's time I wished might fall on me when I was found false to his children or his wife's allies. This is the day wherein I wished to fall by the false faith of him I trusted most. This, this All Souls' Day to my fearful soul is the determined respite of my wrongs. That high all-seer I dallied with hath turned my fainted prayer on my head and given in earnest what I begged in jest. Now Margaret's curse is fallen upon my head. Come, sirs, convey me to the block of shame. Wrong hath but wrong, and blame the due of blame. Scene two, the camp near Tamworth. Fellows in arms, and my most loving friends bruised underneath the yoke of tyranny. Thus far into the bowels of the land have we marched on without impediment. And here receive we from our father Stanley lines of fair comfort and encouragement. The wretched, bloody, and usurping boar that spoiled your summer fields and fruitful vines lies now even in the center of this isle near to the town of Leicester. As we learn from Tamworth, thither is but one day's march. In God's name, cheerly on, courageous friends, to reap the harvest of perpetual peace by this one bloody trial of sharp war. Every man's conscience is a thousand swords to fight against that bloody homicide. I doubt not, but his friends will fly to us. He hath no friends but who are friends for fear, which in his greatest need will shrink from him. All for our vantage. Then in God's name, march. True hope is swift and flies with swallows' wings. Kings, it makes gods and meaner creatures kings. Scene three, Bosworth Field. Here pitch our tents, even here in Bosworth Field. Sir William Catesby, why look you so sad? My heart is ten times lighter than my looks. Sir Richard Radcliffe? Here, most gracious liege. Uh, Radcliffe, we must have knocks. <laughs> must we not? Up with my tent there. 
Who will I lie tonight? Let's want no discipline, make no delay, for Lord's tomorrow is a busy day. The Earl of Pembroke keeps his regiment. Good Captain Blunt, bear my good night to him, and give him from me this most needful scrawl. Upon my life, my lord, I'll undertake it. And so, God give you quiet rest tonight. Good night, good Captain Blunt. Come, gentlemen, let us consult upon tomorrow's business into our tent. The air is raw and cold. What is the clock? It's supper time, my lord. It's nine o'clock. I will not sup tonight. Send out a person at arms to Stanley's regiment. Bid him bring his power before sunrising, lest his son George fall into the blind cave of eternal night. I have not that alacrity of spirit nor cheer of mind that I was wont to have. Bid my guard watch, leave me. Oh, Ratcliffe, about the mid of night, come to my tent and help to arm me. Leave me, I say. Let me sit heavy on thy soul tomorrow. Think how thou stabst me in my prime of youth, a Tewkesbury, despair and die. When I was mortal, my anointed body by thee was punctured full of deadly holes. Think on the tower and me. Despair and die. Henry the Sixth bid thee despair and die. Let me sit heavy on thy soul tomorrow. I that was washed to death with fulsome wine, poor Clarence by the guile betrayed to death. Tomorrow in the battle think on me and fall thy edgeless sword. Despair and die. Let me sit heavy on thy soul tomorrow. Rivers that died at Pomfret, despair and die. Bloody and guilty, guiltily awake, and in a bloody battle end thy days. Think on Lord Hastings, despair and die. Dream on thy cousins, smothered in the tower. Let us be led within thy bosom, Richard, and weigh thee down to ruin, shame, and death. Thy nephew's souls bid thee despair and die. Richard, thy wife, that wretched Anne, thy wife, that never slept a quiet hour with thee, now fills thy sleep with perturbations. Tomorrow in the battle think on me, and for thy edgeless sword, despair and die. Dream on, dream on of bloody deeds and death. Fainting, despair, despairing, yield thy breath. Have mercy, Jesus. Soft, I did but dream. 
coward conscience, how dost thou afflict me? What do I fear? Myself, there's none else by. Richard loves Richard, that is, I am I. Is there a murderer here? No, yes, I am. Then fly, what from myself? Great reason why, lest I revenge. What, myself upon myself? Alack, I love myself, wherefore? For any good that I myself have done unto myself. <laughs> no. Alas, I rather hate myself for hateful deeds committed by myself. I'm a villain, yet I lie. I am not fool of thyself, speak well. Fool, do not flatter! My conscience hath a thousand several tongues, and every tongue brings in a several tale, and every tale condemns me for a villain. I shall despair. There is no creature who loves me. And if I die, no soul shall pity me. Nay, wherefore should they? Since then I myself find in myself no pity to myself. My lord! <laughs> Who's there? Uh, Radcliffe, my lord, tis I. The early village clock hath twice done salutation to the morn. Your friends are up and buckle on their armor. Radcliffe, I have dreamed a fearful dream. Oh, Radcliffe, I, I fear. I fear. Nay, my good lord, be not afraid of shadows. By the Apostle Paul, shadows tonight have struck more terror to the soul of Richard than can the substance of ten thousand soldiers armed and proof and led by shallow rich men. It is not yet near day. Come, go with me. Good morrow, Richmond. Uh, cry mercy, lords and watchful gentlemen, that you have taken as tardy sluggard here. How have you slept, my lord? Mm, the sweetest sleep and fairest boating dreams that ever entered in a drowsy head have I since your departure had, my lord. How far the morning Upon the stroke of four. Why then, tis time to arm and give direction. <clears throat> More than I have said, Loving countrymen, the leisure and enforcement of the time forbids to dwell upon, yet remember this. God and our good cause fight upon our side. Richard, except those whom we fight against, had rather have us win than him they follow. For what is he they follow? Truly, gentlemen, a bloody tyrant and a homicide. One that hath ever been God's enemy. Then... If you fight against God's enemy, God will in justice ward you as his soldiers. If you do sweat to put a tyrant down, you sleep in peace, the tyrant being slain. If you do fight against your country's foes, the country's fat shall pay your pains the higher. If you do fight and safeguard of your wives, your wives shall welcome home the conquerors. If you do free your children from the sword, your children's children quit it in your age. Then, in the name of God and all these rights, advance your standards, draw your willing swords. For me, the ransom of my bold attempt shall be this cold corpse on the earth's cold face. But if I thrive, the gain of my attempt, the least of you shall share his part thereof. Sound drums and trumpets boldly and cheerfully. God and St. George, Richmond and victory! Yeah! yeah. Woo! Yeah! Woo! So, gentlemen, every man unto his charge. Let not our babbling dreams affright our souls. Conscience is but a word that cowards use, devised at first to keep the strong in awe. Our strong arms be our conscience. Swords our law. March on. Join bravely. Let's to it pell-mell. If not to heaven, then hand in hand to hell. Uh Huzzah! Woo! <laughs> Good! <laughs> <laughs>
my lord, I'll help you to a horse. Lady, I have set my life upon a cast, and I will stand the hazard of a die. I think there are six Richmonds in the field. Five have I slain today instead of him. A horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. <gasps> Richard! Richmond. <laughs> God, in your arms be praised, victorious friends. The day is ours. The bloody dog is dead. Courageous Richmond, well hast thou acquit thee. Lo here, this long usurped royalty from the dead temples of this bloody wretch have we plucked off to grace thy brows with all. Wear it, enjoy it, and make much of it. Proclaim a pardon to the soldiers fled that in submission will return to us. And then, as we have taken the sacrament, we will unite the white rose and the red. Smile, heaven, upon this fair conjunction that long have frowned upon their enmity. Oh, now let Richmond and Elizabeth, the true succeeders of each royal house, by God's fair ordinance, conjoin together, and let their heirs, God, if thy will be so. Enrich the time to come with smooth-paced peace. Now civil wounds are stopped. Peace lives again that she may live long here. God say amen. <laughs> <laughs> 